I want to start my talk, it might be a bit unusual, but I will start my talk with actually uh, showing you a YouTube uh, video, which has started me on that uh, project. Maybe some of you know of or have heard of it or, uh, already. It's a, it's a double rainbow video that is uh, actually one of the examples of viral videos on, on YouTube. Um, has 45 million uh, 49 now views. So I don't know, do you see my the screen? Yeah, great. So I will just start the Whoa, that's a full rainbow. All the way. Double rainbow. Oh my god. It's a double rainbow all the way. Whoa, that's so intense. Whoa. 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 Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Whoa. Oh. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Oh my Oh my, oh my god, look at that. It's starting to even look like a triple rainbow. Oh my god, it's full on double rainbow all the way across the sky. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh god. <sighs> okay, I will stop here, but I encourage you to look at uh, look at the rest, um, and maybe I'll share the rest of the of the talk. But you can now understand why there is a double rainbow um, on on the first uh, uh, slide. And basically, I'm I'm really interested in in the type of experience that uh, um, the character in, of this video pull. Um, Paul the Bear is called, um, Paul the Bear uh, reports. That is something, and, and you can see from the way he described what's going on, that uh, on the one hand, there is no doubt that the object of his perception is real. He is actually filming it. He's talking to the camera saying, look at this. There are various aspects of this type of experience that shows that he's taking the object of his subjective experience as real and a perception. At the same time, the video is interesting because we hear from his exclamations and, and expressions of disbelief that there is something about the reality or, or updating his beliefs about the reality of what he's perceiving that is not going on normally. There is a kind of resistance. So that's the category that I want to focus on something which shares the characteristic of perception, but it's still taken as being extraordinary when it comes to um, uh, the sense of reality. So in this respect, I'm not talking about uh, hallucinations, which have been discussed much in the literature, when in that case, uh, if, if Paul was hallucinating a rainbow, we would be in a, in a case where his experience would be of a double rainbow, but there would be no incoming uh, stimulus. It's not also a case, I, at least uh, I hope the video is clear here, of canonical perception when uh, there is an incoming stimulus, but there is no sense of subjective confusion, right? If you and I just see a double rainbow, usually we just or not that confused about it, or maybe you are, but uh, then I would be happy to hear about your examples of extraordinary perceptions. It's not also um, similar, I, I would argue, to um, uh, most of the cases which have been discussed so far and are discussed in the, in the literature about uh, reality monitoring, where there seems to be a confusion as to whether someone is perceiving or imagining. Because in that case, what is really going on is something uh, different, which is that it's clearly a perception, but there is still a confusion within the sense of uh, reality. So that's the category I'm interested in. And that's 
the definition uh, based on Paul's example that I want uh, uh, to provide or offer as um, um, capturing this category. On the one hand, the subject, in that case, Paul, is clearly aware that they are per perceiving the object, um, that the object is outside in the, in the world, that it is real, and it's clearly aware that they are not imagining um, the object. On the other hand, another characteristic is that their sense of reality is still significantly uh, um, different from canonical uh, uh, episodes of perception. In the case of Paul, it's a bit like what we can call the wall factor, which seems to be a sort of there is too much reality uh, almost coming from that uh, experience. But of course, the category is also flexible and can include other um, um, uh, alteration or confusion within the subjective sense of uh, reality. These two uh, characteristics I'm, I'm aware, and that's uh, um, clearly uh, something that we've already discussed in, uh, in the previous talks, they're more on the subjective or qualitative characterizations. But I do believe that we can find behavioral and uh, um, uh, belief updating consequences when subjects are in the state of extraordinary perception. There are clearly uh, manifestations here in the way uh, Paul expresses himself or reports his experience, but also at them of behavior, I, I believe that extraordinary perception would be uh, uh, leading to a sort of friction or, or um, uh, an incapability to update beliefs in the same way as it happens in case of uh, canonical perception. So, the definition centers on the subjective characteristics, but it doesn't mean that there's only this type of uh, characteristics that are um, um, definitional of this state. Now, I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the anecdotal uh, case of uh, uh, Paul Vasquez and this too real double win, uh, rainbow. And instead, I want to also generalize the category to other types of uh, uh, experiences. Some of them are more controversial than others because they are classified differently at the moment in the literature. So as I was uh, briefly mentioning uh, uh, during the break, um, there's an issue about some type of experience that we are generating in the lab uh, when we test multisensory perception. So, for instance, for people who are familiar with either the McGurk effect, where the syllables that we hear are incongruent with the visual movement that we see on the lips of the, um, of the speaker, or other multisensory uh, illusions like the double flash illusion, when people are presented with one flash and, and presented with two sounds and tend to report or having seen uh, uh, two flashes, then consistently, either when you're a subject of the experiment, but when you also interview people, then there is a sense that there is something clearly perceptual, there is no doubt. And it, of course, it's embedded in an, in an experiment where things are presented on the screen. So it's clearly perception. But suddenly, these cases of multisensory illusion starts to feel fishy in a sense that looks like these cases of extraordinary perception. So that's really where my interest in this category started from. Relatedly, um, I've been doing uh, some work in collaboration with uh, a psychologist and a philosopher Anna Tsunika regarding depersonalization and derealization. And looking here at the qualitative and uh, uh, also um, cognitive work, I think it's fair to uh, distinguish two types of derealization. So it's true that some patients will report and behave uh, according to what we would call the type one derealization, where indeed they are not sure or they seem to, to have a confusion regarding whether the experience that they're having is real or imagined. But there is also additionally patients that I would say are, are uh, suffering from a type two derealization better captured by the category of this extraordinary perception. They're not at all in doubt that the word is real, that the object that they're faced with is uh, perceived, that the content of their experience is perceptual content, but something in their belief updating or their affect or their response to this experience still generates this extra friction that makes them unable 
to sort of fully uh, accept it as uh, other people would um, were not suffering from this derealization. So again, having this category might help not running together different uh, cases of patients with derealization. Another uh, uh, category that is of interest, and maybe um, uh, we can talk about that in the, in the discussion, is the thing that in some aesthetic experiences also, there can be this type of uh, extraordinary aspect, and maybe that's something that is um, uh, explicitly designed to generate this extraordinary perception. Um, and finally, and this, these two categories are more work in progress um, or things that uh, came out, out of uh, discussions after presenting this talk. Uh, people have pointed also that uh, the perception of patterns in, in external uh, reality is a very interesting uh, case. So um, people would tend to have conspiracy theory, uh, report seeing patterns, but at the, uh, unless you're totally uh, uh, convinced, there is this mild moment where you start feeling that this pattern, you perceive these patterns, but you feel a bit strange about seeing this pattern. So you feel that people around you have the same face or the same code, for instance. And it's clear that you're seeing these codes, but there's something fishy about that pattern as well. So it could be something that helps building this category of conspirational uh, perception. So um, what I want to do in the, in the rest of the talk, having hopefully convinced you that there is a category of cases here uh, that is distinct from cases where we are in doubt regarding the fact that we are perceiving or imagining, is to see how we can adjust or, or, or not uh, the existing accounts about the sense of reality in this negotiation of the boundaries between perception and imagination in order to account for uh, extraordinary perception. So what about the sense of reality in this first uh, role? Well, um, going back in time, I, I think it's quite interesting to sort of put on the table the type of views that have been offered. So um, going back to, maybe it's now that I've moved to Germany, I start to go to history of philosophy uh, and quote uh, uh, non-British uh, philosophers. But Carl Jaspers had this very long list, uh, for instance, of um, uh, characteristics that are supposed to, to uh, uh, explain what made the perception uh, feel real. And as you can see, um, some of them seems to be just reformulation uh, uh, of, of sense of reality, perception of concrete reality. But he would stress the fact that the content, for instance, has a certain sort of objectivity in terms of special and it, it's perceived as external. It's also have this kind of uh, clear boundaries. So the fact that it is vividness or, or clarity. Um, although vividness is also captured below with this idea that they are full and fresh. Um, they also can be retained without the images tends to be uh, uh, to dissipate. And uh, it was already mentioning the independence of our will. But what's interesting here is that I think it's one of the clear representatives where people want to put the reality in the content of the perception. So we can look at what is perceived and then this level one uh, dimensions locates the reality uh, or the imaginary uh, nature of the, the, um, the experience we're having. On the other hand, uh, we have a second sort of family of views which tend to locate the, the difference between perception and imagination in the mode or the quality of the experience. So not what is experienced, but how it is experienced. Um, and this is, for instance, the list that uh, Kathleen Farkas has uh, proposed in an earlier paper talking about hallucination. The, uh, and Maybe I'm over reading what she means by quality and, and, and rolling her in the mode uh, view, but there seems to be here a, a way in which this uh, characteristics are not in the, as I said, what you perceive, but in the how it's perceived. So it's perceived as being uh, involuntary and, and independent, for instance. And finally, a third family of, of views, which uh, uh, tend to be more recent, and I think Nadine would side uh, would fit in that categories, in that in this category, uh, metacognitive uh, views um, uh, 
In this case, Jérôme Dokish and uh, Jean-Rémy Martin have proposed that the sense of reality is actually a specific, what they call noetic uh, feeling that accompanies our experience. And the type of argument they have is that we can actually dissociate the content from the sense of reality. So for instance, in virtual reality, you can have very poorly realistic, like pixelized contents and still they can fool you into uh, acting and interacting with them and have a high sense of perceptual reality. On the other hand, they point that their contents with which have a high uh, uh, realistic nature, they are very vivid, they are very detailed and delineated, but they still strike at least some people uh, uh, with derealization with a low sense of perceptual reality. Because of this dissociation, I think it's impossible to locate the sense of reality in the content. I think it's harder for them to respond to, to the mode view and think this is not a way in which uh, this content is experienced. But still, this, they, I think, also drawing on the type of evidence that Nadine was offering and the, the fantastic explanatory work that metacognition can do suggests that the sense of reality can be uh, identified with uh, metacognitive feeling. Um, in that case, based on various reality uh, monitoring uh, processes. So I certainly don't want to uh, um, uh, uh, neglect the fact that uh, keeping track of the difference between reality and imagination is hugely important. And we need to keep especially uh, track of this um, or at least this is a very specific challenge when we think about uh, perception in all cases being the result of a combination of top-down and uh, bottom-up uh, information. So we need to keep track of what is coming from the mind already, uh, even in perception, and uh, what is coming from the world. Now, what the previous literature has been looking at are cases where this distinction can be drawn successfully. So for instance, when we successfully distinguish dreams, imagination, uh, uh, and uh, wrong perceptual expectations, for instance, that we discard from uh, real uh, sensations and perception. Cases also where uh, things go wrong, as can be the case in hallucination or synesthesia. And uh, I think I want to add to the category of cases where it's not really clear what is not going, going right. Uh, cases like that have been discussed like lucid dreams or drug induced, induced, uh, induced experiences. But as I said, um, this is a third sort of uh, cases of confusion and it has these two characteristic of being clearly perceptual and still confusing. So that's where I situate the, uh, the investigation. And um, the two things I want to do in the, in the remaining time is to see how to explain this extraordinary perception and to see whether we can generalize from them to explain what's going on with the sense of reality in canonical cases of perception. So I'm, I'm deeply aware that in a way, I'm not talking that much about imagination, but I think <laughs> Uh, the sense of reality here is a different one, so that might uh, um, trigger some interesting discussions. So um, I think there is a first here trouble um, if we try to uh, explain extraordinary uh, perceptions just having uh, strict content views. And here I want to, uh, to draw on an analogy or a parallel with the type of um, uh, challenges that Ned Block has, has put forward against uh, probabilistic accounts of perceptual content. So some people are keen to say that content, perceptual content itself could be uh, representing a probability of different objects. Uh, for instance, if somebody is approaching, you could say that you're not clearly seeing whether it's your friend Leila or not. And in that case, someone like uh, Morrison, for instance, has suggested that the content of your experience represents 80% size of Leila and 20% non-Leila. And that explains why you will not uh, be totally confident that um, this is your friend Leila. And so the content of perception itself is probabilistic. Now, the question becomes whether we can have this type of account for the sense of reality. Could you represent, for instance, the double rainbow as 
90% real, but 10% imaginary. And I think that's uh, uh, the type of uh, analysis that the content view of uh, the sense of reality would push us to have in that case. So as I said, this is in analogy with um, this type of uh, probabilistic content of uh, perception uh, idea. So the issue here would be that uh, pushing the, the sense of reality in, in, in the content and making it a question of probability in the content, like I said, like I, I see the rainbow as 80% perceptual and 20% imagined, wouldn't really take care of the first characteristic uh, that I've outlined as uh, uh, fundamental to extraordinary perceptions. That is that there's a sense in which it's clearly perceptual. So I, a lot of the argument, of course, depends in, in accepting this duality and accepting that uh, this is absolutely taken as uh, uh, perceptual. But I do believe that uh, we can draw, or we can support this argument by saying that in canonical perception, we clearly don't have even just a very high percentage of probability that what we are perceiving is real. There's just something in the same sense as, as Ned Block was, was pushing, saying that the content of perception as it is given to us is not probabilistic. The sense of reality in canonical perception is just not given to us as even a very high probability when we just have this as a categorical tag on the content and not a probabilistic one. I think another argument would be to say that it would be, from a design perspective, absolutely useless to carry very high level of probability instead of a categorical uh, tag. So for this reason, I think we have, from a subjective and uh, design perspective, good reasons to think that above a certain level, we just mark some contents as clearly perceptual and not carry the further remaining remote probability that this is generated by your perception, by your imagination. So in this sense, uh, I think the, the, the type of categorical account of the content of perception uh, as real that I'm suggesting here is perfectly still compatible with Bayesian accounts of uh, the brain, which have already, in the case of the content of perception, accepted that uh, there could be a, a process in which we compare the probability of a and B, or this is Leila and not Leila. This is compatible with a selection process taking place at some stage and only one percept being made uh, uh, available to the agent, while the information of the, the probability of the other is just fully suppressed at the later stage. So we are not keeping representing probabilities up all the way uh, up. This is uh, a bit what is suggested in the, in the paper um, by uh, Andy Clark and Carl Friston and Sam Wilkinson, where they say that um, there is at some point a way in which the brain will just assume a content as 100% uh, agent certain. But I still think that talking about 100% agent certain is a bit ambivalent because it's as if you continue representing the probabilities. And here, mm -hmm. I. I'm much more sympathetic with an account similar to the one that Stephen Gross has put forward, saying that uh, when we're talking about uh, probabilities here, we are not locating them in the, uh, in the contents, but um, if they have to be uh, uh, probabilities, they're suppressed in the content and they can be pushed in, in the attitude. So at some point, Gross uh, really uh, considers that we will just assign a categorical nature to the representation. And if uncertainty arises again after that, it will have to be towards the attitude toward this content. So I would argue that we can posit that the similar selection process uh, gives a categorical tag for the reality of the content of perception. Once there is a, only a very low probability that this is generated by imagination, your brain stop represented this probability and gives you the content as just real. So this is true in extraordinary perceptions, I would uh, suggest, and this is, explains uh, why this is not the case where there is a confusion with imaginations. So we've, we've pushed that forward. Uh, on, we've pushed that on the side in that case. So at the same time, we have explained one of the first characteristic of extraordinary perception, but uh, not the second one. So the categorical tag will not be sufficient to explain 
what's going on with uh, Paul Vasquez, the Paul the Bear, for instance. So um, what about this sense of reality uh, being different from canonical episodes of perception? The, uh, the question that Paul, or we assume Paul is no longer uh, asking himself is, am I seeing this or imagining in this? There is a categorical yes regarding this question. And in also in other cases of extraordinary perception. But whereas it is clear that the content of the, the experience is real, not all confusions dissipate. There are uh, two aspects, as I said initially, that uh, continue to characterize this experience. There is a subjective feeling uh, that remains to be uh, uh, captured, but I will just continue capturing it as equivalent to there is something fishy about this perception. And especially this statement shows that the fishiness is attributed to perception. It's not there is something fishy about my experience and fishiness being eventually you know, a, a reason to wonder whether it's a product of my imagination. The fishiness is clearly the fishiness about the perception. And there is also, as I was mentioning, a functional criterion where for whichever reason uh, and or whichever aspects of, of this uh, uh, experience, some signal is stopping my belief updating or action tendencies uh, to treat this as fully real, although I also feel pushed to treat it as real. So we have a case of dissonance uh, that would be manifested at the level of belief and action um, uh, and, and their expression. So what should we add to the categorical model? And this is uh, the type of uh, um, what we call composite accounts that we have put forward with um, uh, students in my group, Sophia Ra, saying that what's happening in the case of the double rainbow, as I said, is that there's a clear reality of the content, but there are various levels of confusions that arise at uh, possibly um, uh, from different uh, sources and different origins. On the one hand, there could be things like a low perceptual confidence, low uh, metacognitive uh, um, confidence in that case. There can be also low multisensory confidence. Um, I should make it clear that uh, there's a high suspicion that Paul the Bear Vasquez was under the influence of some substances when reporting um, the, uh, the case of the double rainbow, although it's just an open hypothesis, so we don't know in that case, but that would maybe affect some multisensory um, uh, congruence phenomena, including in vestibular system eventually. Um, there can be also uh, uh, higher feelings of controllability that come into place that makes us doubt that this is uh, uh, really a canonical case of perception. But there is also a sense of wondering that is not just the fact that we start reflectingly uh, um, questioning the plausibility of what we are perceiving. I think in a much uh, experiential sense, there is a, a, this feeling of awe, which we have uh, clearly expressed, for instance, in the case of Paul, that makes us effectively uh, uh, suspicious of the, um, the reality of what we are uh, seeing. So it's not a, a necessarily a judgment, it can also be a, an effective evaluation of the content of uh, our uh, perception. So what we are left with is, I think, the impossibility, at least, and it's not an exhaustive uh, list, but I think that what we need here uh, to account for extraordinary perceptions uh, is a composite account for, for various reasons. So on the one hand, some of the aspects of this fishiness, when we compare it to what's going on with canonical cases of perception, seems to be that this is less of a strong, this is less, real, this feels less real than normal perception, like the low confidence. On the other hand, uh, there are, mm -hmm. sorry, because my, there's a problem with my, oh, yes. Uh, on the other hand, there are aspects of this fishiness that comes from a, an excess by contrast with canonical perceptions. For instance, there is too much control. And I think we can really rank, uh, uh, as, as Fiona was also mentioning, there's many uh, uh, grades when we look at the perception imagination aspects, but here also in this extra 
fishiness of our perceptual experiences. I think we need to recognize that sometimes it's because something seems to go a bit missing and sometimes it's because it seems to seem to be a bit too, uh, too much for us. Uh, on the other hand, some of these components will be metacognitive, some uh, can also be more cognitive, and some can also be just, uh, as I was mentioning, much more of the nature of affects, uh, including noetic uh, feelings like fluency and familiarity could come in, into the picture. But I think we cannot uh, just hope to have a single component, especially not just a single metacognitive component that will explain uh, the, the um, fishiness of our sense of reality and extraordinary perception. The reason to have multiple components uh, is to also take into account the various categories and, and differences in the extraordinary perceptions. So initially, when I gave the list of uh, the extension of the concept, I gave all these examples. Now, I'm not uh, suggesting that the fishiness of a patient with derealization, type two derealization, resembles uh, the type of experience that we have in multisensory perception, or resembles the type of uh, experience and, and fishy sense of reality that uh, conspirational perception or aesthetic experiences can give us. That's why we need to have these various dimensions to account for different kinds of uh, fishiness in the sense of reality. The um, this is. Uh, the kind of analysis we could give, for instance, that in the case of Paul's example, uh, there is a sense in which it's too wonderful to be seeing a double rainbow. So there's the wandering component is stronger. In the uh, conspirational experiences, there is a sense of being the center of something and having things in control. In the type two derealization, and we're pushing this forward with experiments, I think there's more uh, cases of disturbed multisensory metacognition. And in some other experiences, as I said, it could come strictly from a unisensory or visual metacognition. So with this multiple component, we can also account for the fact that the fishiness will take stronger, uh, um, uh, the, will have stronger degrees on these various um, components. Okay, so what about the, uh, the generalization? So as I said, what we offer uh, is something a bit uh, intermediate between um, the, the multifaceted modes of presentation accounts that uh, I attributed to Koti Farkas, and the fact that we need to recognize that the sense of reality is something over and above other uh, aspects of things that are going on in the content. But as I hope it's, I made clear by now, I'm not suggesting that our, um, our account is similar because we both want to put a, a part of the reality in the content in a categorical manner and have this overarching uh, uh, feelings, uh, including metacognitive ones, but certainly not reduce them to a single one. So that's how I situate our account in the landscape. Implications are seeing are important besides the fact that we have uh, uh, new categories to account for cases of what maybe instead of extraordinary, we can call, uh, if you prefer it, uh, more neutrally confused perception, but also it generates new and interesting predictions and explanation. The fact that the sense of reality, for instance, will have a nonlinear development because these various components do not necessarily appear at the same time in development in children. Um, and also that there will be nonlinear breakdown in the sense of uh, reality and perception. Finally, it could be that uh, some very young infants and certainly some non-human animals may still have the capacity uh, to, to monitor the difference uh, between perception and imagination with this categorical mechanism, while still not possessing the other capacities that give rise to the sense of reality monitoring in this overarching sense as being either fine or fishy. So I think that's a, a, a plus for this type of, of accounts. Now there are uh, limits and open question and certainly like by having said that in the case of the fishy, confused, extraordinary perceptions, the sense of reality is a composite. I'm at, I want we subject to the same objection, like why doesn't it seem so in the case of canonical perception? Um, so here the, it's a bit the, the sort of, um, uh, pointer rather than a full articulation of an argument. But uh, I think out of consistency, what we have to say is that in canonical perception, we are used to a certain uh, composition. So we are still a certain degree of confidence in vision, 
in uh, multi-sensory, a certain degree of controllability and a certain degree of wandering. And therefore we stop just noticing it. What makes me confident that this is just not uh, uh, an easy solution is that this is actually what we see in multi-sensory cases, that this sense of multi-sensory incongruence and in reality is something you can habituate to and you restore a strong sense of reality that's, that poses no problem when you stop noticing. If I expose you, for instance, to a certain kind of asynchrony between vision and uh, audition. So I think ab habituation would be uh, the, the response to this objection. We habituate to a certain composition and we stop noticing it. So that's the um, uh, last uh, slide. And I want to thank my collaborators in this project and uh, funders and you for your attention. Thank you.